at the archaeological site of Chatelhoyuk, the lifestyle of a post-hunter-gatherer civilization is laid bare. It was a life of toil and hardship. The crowded homes reflect the high-rises of modern cities. Except here, there aren't even any paths between the buildings. This is wall-to-wall -wall occupation. The Great White has a very high metabolism, and it needs to feed on rich, fatty prey such as dolphin, whale, and seal. However, this high-calorie prey often hides out in the colder, hostile waters where most sharks can't survive. But the Great White can increase its body temperature 18 degrees Fahrenheit higher than the surrounding water. The Great White is not a cold-blooded killer, and the secret lies in its tail. The tail is the powerhouse of the Great White Shark and the source of its explosive thrust. It is jam-packed with muscle. Okay, so you can actually clearly see the differences in muscle types here. The white muscle is used for incredible bursts of speed and high-impact acceleration. But this raw power is not sustainable. Yeah, the problem with the white muscle is that it, it lacks the blood supply that the red muscle has got, which is why it's white. And as a result, it can only sustain those bursts of speed for relatively short periods of time. While the white muscles provide the short turbo boosts, it's these red muscles that drive the shark. They run the entire length of the Great White's body and pump the tail like two giant hydraulic pistons. This continuous firing generates enough heat to warm the shark's blood and its internal organs. The tail of the Great White acts like a blast furnace. By warming their blood, everything improves. They can digest food quicker. They can swim faster. Their muscles are stronger and more powerful for sudden bursts of speed to ambush prey. But this blast furnace requires fuel, 10 times more than a human. The small bony fish found in warm waters doesn't satisfy the Great White's needs. So it exploits its warm blood supply to gain access into the colder waters where all the rich, fatty, high-calorie prey hide. The kind of cold waters found at Seal Island. Mike Habib. Hey, Seamus, let's see this armor is meeting with physicist Seamus Blackley to test a replica that estimates Borriello Pelta's armor. So this is the rear haunch of the notosaur that we talked about. We laid down some ribs, some silicon connective tissue. Um, and then on top of it, we developed a polymer that we cast into these scales that have the right level of hardness and the right mechanical properties to match what we think was actually on the animal. Oh, that's perfect. And the the bone that you included? It's cast so that it has the same fracture characteristics as bone. But you didn't just build the perfect armor, though. I know you've also built the perfect predator. When you see the predator, you might be a little bit worried for, for Notosaur. <laughs> All right, Mike, let me introduce you to our Acrocanthosaurus. This is Kathy. Oh, what a beast. Hello, Kathy. Mike, this is as near as we can produce to a mechanically accurate, force accurate Acrocanthosaurus head. She has 48 teeth made out of a special porcelain that we slip cast and then fired so that we have the same strength and fragility, we think, as the teeth of this animal. And gosh, it's terrifying. It really is. I'm really curious to see how Boreal Peltas' armor is going to hold up under a bite from Acrocanthosaurus. Go look at the angle, Mike. Do you like that relative to the mouth? Yeah. They set up to simulate a bite on Boreal Peltas' haunch. 
by force on Acrocanthosaurus was thousands of pounds per square inch. But when you look at what it's up against, this is a very tough armor. This is going to be highly destructive, I think, one way or the other. All right. OK, can you hold it there? Yep. Watson? We're ready. All right, we're go. Powering on. Homing. Three, two, one, fire. <laughs> Notasaur did really well. Well, it lost osteoderms, broke those off. That's a sustainable loss. The keratin, it can regrow. Are we bleeding at this point? I mean, there'd be, yeah, be some bleeding. Let's give it another bite, see what happens if she took a second bite. All right, All right. Watson. Three, two, one, fire. Oh, OK. That's now just a fountain of blood. You can see the ribs. There are the ribs. Yep. This is the connective material on the ribs. That's a rib right there, right? And it's, oh my god, Michael, the rib is shattered. Shattered. Oh, it sure is. Look at that. So this is a slow motion video of the second bite. Oh, that's just oh brutal. Oh my god. Oh, that's just awful. I'm a physicist, not a physician, but. That looked like a tremendous amount of organ damage right there. Yeah. I'm very impressed with both our critters, to be honest. Boreal Pelta held up a little better than, than I might have expected. But it really also, I think, tells us that if Boreal Pelta was attacked by an acrocanthosaur, you would see evidence of that. That's really fun to watch, I have to say. <laughs> Based on our bite tests, it's highly unlikely that a Boreal Pelta would sustain a major bite from a big predator and not show any signs. As spring warms the water along Mexico's west coast, the shift in temperature sparks a plankton bloom. This upwelling of plankton attracts millions of pelagic red crabs to the surface, turning the waters off Baja red. The bottom-dwelling crabs rise from the depths to feed, and some believe to mate. But like the plankton they feed on, they're slaves to the current. The bite-sized crustaceans become easy pickings for migrating seals and whales. Swarms of crabs clump together. As different groups merge, they create a slick up to three miles long. So dense, it blocks out the light. The rising plankton draws another wave of hungry migrants in from the Pacific. Thousands of giant eagle rays. They school together, forming vast shoals across the Sea of Cortez. White wings, taller than a man, beat in a collective dance. But some want to stand out from the crowd. Despite weighing more than a ton, both males and females can launch six feet out of the water. It's all about getting noticed. And for those who do, there's a better chance of leaving with a mate.
on the open plains of Eastern California, a gang of rogue Mustangs is staging a coup. The bachelors come charging in, corralling the females. But the wrangler swoops in to break up the gang. It's a battle of wills. Young blood against a fearless leader. The Wrangler won't back down. Experience wins the day, and his harem is secure. For now. Defeated, the Bachelor gang retreats. But they won't be gone for long. It's a ritual as old as time. The young rise up to contest the old. Each must find their place in the herd. A dozen wood ducks are ready to hatch. All the chicks are born alert and with a full coat of down. They can't fly yet, but they can't stay cramped up here either. After only one day, mom calls for them to boldly go where they've never gone before. Even at this young age, they understand it's time to jump into a brave new world. It's a 30-foot leap of faith. The first brave soul prepares for liftoff. One down. And its brothers and sisters wait in the wings. Typically, all the chicks will jump just minutes apart. But every now and then, there's a failure to launch. Houston, we have a problem. The 
the eagle has landed. For the first time this year, there's a little more daylight than darkness. But the threat of more snow is never far away. The male arctic fox is still searching for his mate. But the beach seems empty. movement amongst the boulders. A white vixen. But she's not his mate. Arctic foxes reunite year after year, so he'll know her by her scent. By far the fox's acutest sense. There's someone else here. Another female. Patiently waiting out the storm. Her scent is masked by the snow. He draws closer. It's her. Arctic foxes often pair for life. It's a deep and complex relationship. They need to get to know each other again before they renew their special bond. It's a busy time of year for Simon Keyes, the resident bounty hunter of the snake world. I saw this sort of big, sort of grayish snake. It's inside the kitchen. I, as soon as I saw it, I just, whoa, you got a big black mamba in there. The snakes I'm most wary of Jeez, is the black mamba. But I get excited. I, I don't, I'm not scared of them. I actually quite like dealing with them. But when you finish with it, you're sweating, your heart rate's going, it's, it's just madness. Back you come, back you come. Problem snake removal is his business. Anyway. Oh, and come don't, summer, don't fight, don't fight. it's silly season for it's snake catchers. It now, it's such on. a fast thing, and the teeth are very small, you know, they're only about that sort of long, probably five mil, six, seven mil, maybe max, and they don't actually need to open their mouth very wide at all. It's almost they just, just quickly bang on the skin. It, um, it doesn't take much. You lucky boy. <laughs> <laughs> Better as the quickest cup of coffee you've ever had. <laughs> Mind getting rid of it. No, I will, don't worry. OK, what am I going to do? Simon has backup. Simon. Neville Vulmerins is a local snake expert who helps Simon keep the human mamba conflict to a minimum. Neville has survived two mamba bites, but he's one of the lucky few. When I was 16, I was bitten by a mamba I was trying to catch. That was the first time. At first, the bite throbs, and after that, you have this tingling feeling sort of moving up your arm. About an hour and a half later, I was in hospital unconscious and uh, only came out of it about 70 hours later. If you're a ballerina, you're going to fall, you're going to twist your ankle. If you're a racing driver, you're going to crash. A snake catcher, unfortunately, you get bit. Catching deadly mambas may seem like an exciting hobby, but their lives hang in the balance with every call. Yep, okay. yep. There is a war brewing in Mamba Valley. Mambas kill people, and people kill mambas. Every year during the silly season, hundreds of snakes are killed or captured for the fast-growing exotic reptile trade. Okay. Okay. A 
black mamba fetches around $160 in the snake trade, and they're in high demand to collectors around the globe. Concentration levels go through the roof, because if you slip, Mike. you are potentially dead. It's gonna bite me. I haven't got this thing blacker today. Right there. Do you want me to grab it? Oh, you mm -hmm. Actually, you've got more. Uh-uh. Not happy about this at all. No. I need to get my finger behind. Do you want to take that off the If you slightly yeah. release your grip for half a second, he will take a gap and bite you. Doesn't matter how many times you do this, you can so easily it's not one slip. Of, it's not one of the cases of fractures, it's perfect. Just watch those two top things, don't slide. OK, yeah. I've got Not it. Right, yeah. Got the tail? Yeah, yeah, sorry. It's a bit up. Yeah. Right. yeah. It was a bit close to my liking. These things are like a loaded gun. But it's got its own mind. It pulls its own trigger. It doesn't need someone to help it. It's game over for a life in leafy suburbia. After more than 10 years of planning, Yay! $50 million, and the combined brain power of over 200 international scientists. Attention, attention, doors and roof will be opening. Atento, Guardia de Control, Apex Dos. Finally, the time comes to try and make an image of a black hole. And this has been a huge process, a very, very careful process. And the imaging team is now getting the first set of data they can use to make a photo of a black hole. It's really exciting. We just got the data. And that's, you know, what we've been waiting for for many years. So it's a pretty exciting time for us. This is the moment when we finally get to see what a black hole might look like. Each member of the team loads the data and starts running their algorithms. Are we going to, are we doing this? Uh, let's see it. OK, okay ready, ready? Uh, set, go. go, going, going, going. Dropbox. The algorithms are producing some tantalizing images. This is very early stages. This is exploratory surgery. The patient is on the table. We've opened the patient up. We're looking inside. We're trying to find out what we see. Each member of the team needs to zero in on one consistent image. That is interesting. Whoa. <laughs> I'm getting something pretty similar, a little bit. And with the data for the black hole M87, one image soon becomes clear. I see a circle-y feature. <laughs> a bright ring of light circling the shadow of the black hole. What I'm seeing on the screen here is pretty startling. This is a case where the signal is so clear that it kind of hits you on the head with a hammer. If this holds up, it's gonna be the discovery of my lifetime, and I think of many other people's lifetime. And it's, uh, it's really sobering to see what a black hole looks like for the first time. The hunter-gatherer tribes congregating at Gebekli Tepe 11,000 years ago had started down the path of organized religion, sowing the seeds of a wider culture, paving the way for the agricultural revolution, and kick-starting civilization itself. Some 5,000 years later, the revolution they helped bring about have produced a Stone Age city. At the archaeological site of Chatelhoyuk, the lifestyle of a post-hunter-gatherer civilization is laid bare. 
it was a life of toil and hardship. The crowded homes reflect the high rises of modern cities. Except here, there aren't even any paths between the buildings. This is wall-to-wall -wall occupation. About uh, 6,500 BC, uh, there were about 8,000 people, we think, all crammed into this space. At its peak, Chattelhoyuk was a metropolis run on farming. These people still hunted and gathered a, a wide range of wild animals and plants, but the economy was based on domesticated sheep and on wheats and barleys and so on. But this new sedentary lifestyle took its toll on health. <laughs> Tied to their domestic crops and animals and constantly working the land, quality of life plummeted. We've been able to track the health of people. And what you find is that as the population reaches its highest density, you find lots of wear and tear on the body. You know, these people are having to do more in you know, harder work. And you also see lots of negative health impacts, particularly, you know, things like a decay of teeth and osteoarthritis and, and so on. The agricultural revolution we now think of as progress might actually have been a poison chalice. If life was so hard as a farmer, why do they not go back to hunting and gathering? Some anthropologists think they simply had no choice but to carry on farming. An on-site reconstruction of a typical Chattelhoyuk home reveals the size of their stake in this new lifestyle. So what you can see in a house like this is that they're beginning to build up a lot of stuff, like benches and ovens and hearths. And uh, once you have made that investment, you're very much tied down. You can't move around the landscape so much anymore. You're already trapped in a certain way of life that you can't really turn back from. Even if they had wanted a return to the simpler existence of the hunter-gatherer, the path to civilization was set. Like Eden's original inhabitants, Adam and Eve, the people of Chattelhoyuk were condemned to toil in the fields. And it was a world which carried new levels of risk. Below ground, Hamada finds precious treasures, another sign that many of these people were a cut above the average Joe. This statue is a magical talisman. It represents a god believed to protect the spirits of the dead, called Ptah Sokar. He was one of the main gods of Saqqara. The name of Saqqara was derived from the god Ptah Sokar. We found hundreds of them. Statues of the god became very fashionable among the elite at this time. Another one. In June 2013, a similar one from a private collection went for $40,000 at auction. Ordinary Egyptians could not afford treasures like these. But the rich used their wealth to try to guarantee their journey to the afterlife. My God, a gilded one. I have never seen a gilded face in a great condition like this one. The coffin of Tagemi also reveals how they plastered their coffins with magical spells, prayers from the Book of the Dead. The ancient Egyptians had only one anxiety. They believed that there was a hereafter. The anxiety was caused because they did not know how to go from here to there. So the Book of the Dead is a handbook with all of the answers, a quick guide on how to get to the afterlife safely and successfully. These expensive treasures reveal how the way rich Egyptians buried their dead started to change during the late period. It became more commercialized. The operation of mummification and burial. It is a religious one, number first, but also it is a business, number two. Many people deal with this operation. The carpenters, the people in the market, the uh, people who make uh, statues, the priests, the guards, the people who take care of the mummification uh, operation itself, all is a business. 
So how big was the scale of this business? Hamada thinks the answers lie buried within the new chamber. Over the next few days, Hamada's team carefully clears the burial chamber. The work is slow and painstaking. But what started with one giant coffin is now a megatomb with over a hundred coffins that fill every inch of space. Burying all these people required a massive operation. These coffins show how Saqqara was home to a huge industry of death, where the dead were the customers. Saqqara had a huge funerary industry, and this was really a money-making endeavor. We know that they had personnel to sell space in a tomb or tombs. We know that they were selling mummification. Uh, we know that uh, there were priests involved uh, doing the rituals. Um, so all of this costs a lot of money. This mega tomb is the largest concentration of coffins ever unearthed in Egypt, three times bigger than anything previously found. This deserted quarry, a 30-minute drive from Shanghai, was earmarked to become the exact opposite of a tourist destination. The government planned to make this place as a, a treatment place for the garbage. But a developer had a vision to create a hotel with a feature so unique that people would travel from around the world to experience it. Tasked with turning this site from garbage can to gold mine was architect Martin Yachtman. When I first the quarry, actually it was completely overgrown and the water level was quite high. It was more like a lake, which was surrounded by old industrial buildings and overgrown vegetation. Martin used the location's natural assets as a starting point for his design. The inspiration for the uh, design came from the quarry and from the greenery, from the rocks, from the waterfalls. And uh, it needed to span between the ground level and the bottom of the quarry itself. This was uh, what would make it really outstanding and spectacular. Martin was keen to create a building that fitted naturally and seamlessly into the environment. What appears to be just a two-story, grass-covered complex at ground level is only the tip of the structural iceberg. Hidden below is the main 16-story hotel room section of the building, the design embracing shapes from within the quarry. One half curves in, the other out. Between them is a waterfall-like glass atrium, which houses the elevator shafts and services. But it's at water level where things are most unusual. Here, huge 16-foot deep aquariums hold over 300 tons of water, so the lowest two floors of restaurants and guest suites have huge windows onto an extraordinary underwater world. What I try to do is to create a building mass that joined with the quarry and became part of it. It became part of the overall character of the quarry itself. Across San Francisco Bay from Oakland, an ambitious New Deal project is underway. The Golden Gate Bridge is soon to be one of the wonders of the modern world. Work begins in 1933, and by 1936, is nearing completion. The project offers good pay and a steady job, but not without risk. As a rule of thumb, construction companies expect one death for every million dollars spent. The bridge costs 35 million, During construction, 30 workers fall. But 19 are saved by a safety net strung underneath. Architect Irving Morrow chooses the bridge's rich color, international orange, which he feels blends perfectly with the landscape. 
The first vehicles cross on May 28, 1937. At the time, it's the world's longest suspension bridge. A golden gate to a bright American future. <laughs>